Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to call this hearing to order and recognize that I think this is the first time in the history of the Intelligence Committee that we have met in the Rules Committee space, and I think uh, we probably owe that to the distinguished former chairman of the Rules Committee, Senator Blunt. Um, we would hope, I know you're still the ranking member, but there's been a series of requests from Intel Committee staff that we would like a ship uh, put in our skiff uh, as well. Um, uh, only, only the Rules Committee can have a ship. I, <laughs> no ship is available. Can, can you say NGA West? <laughs> Um, well, again, I'd like to call this committee to, to order, and again, we appreciate the, uh, the cooperation of our colleagues on the Rules Committee for letting us use this setting. Welcome, Ambassador Burns. Um, I know, as we talked in, in the ante room, that um, your wife, Lisa, is still hard at work in, in Geneva, and your daughters are watching remotely, but I know they are here with you in spirit. I'd like to say... Congratulations on your nomination to be the next director of the CIA. After a long and distinguished career in the Foreign Service, you, have, you deserve a well-earned retirement. But the country still needs your talents. Ambassador Burns, Bill, thank you for once again being willing to serve our country. Welcome also to our two distinguished guests who are joining us remotely, former Secretary of State James Baker and former Defense Secretary and CIA Director Leon Panetta. It's going to be a privilege to hear from such eminent and bipartisan public servants who will introduce Ambassador Burns and, again, I think is a great indication of his broad-based support. Um, I understand that some of our members may be joining us remotely today as well, although I would like to acknowledge um, Senator Casey for his – he appeared yesterday remotely, but uh, for his first in-person Intelligence Committee meeting, and we're – very glad, Bob, to have you on the committee. After the Vice Chairman and I give our opening statements, Secretaries Baker and Panetta will say a few words and Ambassador Burns will make, then make his remarks. After this, members' questions will be for five minutes in order of arrival. Ambassador Burns has provided us with written responses to questions from the committee, and today's hearing will provide members the opportunity to thoughtfully consider his qualifications, hear directly from the nominee, and for Ambassador Burns to share his views on how he would lead the women and men of the Central Intelligence Agency. Bill took the Foreign Service exam in November 1979, just a few days after the seizure of our embassy in Tehran, and went on to spend over three decades in the Foreign Service, working under both Democratic and Republican presidents, and ably representing America around the world and at the highest ranks of the State Department. He's been confirmed by the Senate five times. Um, so going for six today, and has served in both the number two and three positions at the State Department, Deputy Secretary of State and Undersecretary for Political Affairs. He's been our nation's ambassador to Russia and Jordan, and in a variety of other senior national security roles, and holds the highest rank in the State Department, that of career ambassador. He is currently the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the oldest international think tank in the United States. It's safe to say that Ambassador Burns is intimately familiar with the challenges and opportunities that the United States faces around the globe, in many cases with firsthand, on-the-ground experience and expertise. It is the key qualities of expertise and sound judgment that perhaps above all others will be most important in your role as the director of the CIA. After four years during which the expertise and judgment of America's civil servants were at times belittled and discounted, the next director must lead and inspire patriotic professionals with humility and compassion, work collaboratively with allied governments, and dispassionately judge the actions of our adversaries. CIA has in some ways been luckier than many other agencies. Director Haspel, your predecessor, uh, has led the CIA with distinction under very difficult conditions. But I'll be looking to hear your views on how to inspire CIA's intelligence professionals who often risk much, <coughs> sacrifice much, and sometimes up to and including their health and lives in service of our country, and oftentimes without recognition because of the requirement to do that in secret. 
I'd like to hear how you plan to reinforce the credo, no matter the political pressure, no matter what, that CIA officers will always do the right thing and speak truth to power. And it is up to America's leaders, including you if you are confirmed, to ensure that the CIA's officers will not face retribution or retaliation for speaking that truth to power. Beyond this basic task, our country faces a host of hazards, from China's drive to surpass the United States technologically, to Russia's continued malign efforts in cyberspace and disinformation, to the ongoing threats from Iran and North Korea. Moreover, moreover we are still in the midst of a global pandemic, although with hope on the horizon that has taken the lives and livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of Americans. These challenges are difficult, but with our traditionally strong network of alliances, they are surmountable. We will always rely on the CIA to be the nation's eyes and ears, to see over the horizon and to give us warnings of threats and challenges, not simply the ones we are facing now and in the near term, but those in the future, against which, against which we must begin to prepare today. Fulfilling this committee's oversight obligations will require transparency and responsiveness from your office. We may, be at times, we may at times ask difficult questions of you and your staff, and we will expect honest, complete, and timely answers. At the same time, we will also want you to feel free to come to the committee with situations that warrant our partnership. You can always count on this committee to hear you out, give you a fair shake, usually without the partisan tinge that has unfortunately affected much of the rest of this Capitol. We'll have much more to discuss during today's questions, but I want to take this moment to assure you that should you be confirmed, I look forward to working closely with you to defend this nation's security. Thank you again for your years of service to our country and for stepping forward yet again in agreeing to serve. I look forward to your testimony, and with that, I recognize the distinguished Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Ambassador, uh, thank you for being with us today. I, I join the Chairman in, in offering you and, and your family our congratulations and or condolences, as you may deem appropriate, for your nomination at, at this important time in, in our nation's history with these challenges that we face. The role that you've been nominated to fill is, uh, is without parallel in our government. Uh, if confirmed, you'll sit at the nexus of the agency's intelligence collection analysis, covert action, counterintelligence, and liaison relationships with foreign intelligence services. Responsibility for any of these missions uh, would be an enormous undertaking for any single one of them, let, let alone all of them. But, but the core mission of the agency is and remains the collection of, of intelligence, the analysis of that intelligence to help inform policymakers and the decisions they make, and then, of course, operations as well. And, um, and in that context, the, the, as director, you'll be responsible for managing the CIA officers and employees of today, but also for cultivating the workforce that go we're going to need in the years to come. So this, in my view, entails that the specialized skills and expertise needed to solve today's unique intelligence challenges are resident at, at the agency, but also it involves looking ahead a decade and thinking about what the next critical skill set is going to be that the officers will need. So I appreciate your insights as to how you intend to achieve and accomplish that in your time there. On the subject of for workforce management, I want to mention that the committee, in particular uh, Senator Collins and others, are extremely interested uh, and invested in ensuring that any officers who've been injured in the field are afforded access to the health care and the benefits that, that they need. And this is particularly true when it comes to injuries that seem to be consistent with uh, symptoms of traumatic brain injury. So if confirmed, I ask for your commitment to work with the committee so that we can find the appropriate legislative or policy changes that ensure that the CIA's commitment to the health and care of its officers is never left in doubt and that we are applying the necessary resources to determine who was behind these things and, and uh, at the, uh, that have impacted personnel from various agencies. And, and I want to be clear, uh, the government of the United States needs to solve this problem, needs to take care of our people, but needs to also forcefully respond to whoever is responsible for hurting Americans who are serving our country overseas. Uh, to today, the, the United States faces an array of, of diverse national security threats, uh, an array of threats that is as challenging as any in our history. Uh, the longstanding hostility from Putin's regime in Russia, Iran, North Korea, a global pandemic moving into its second year, violent extremism, state and non-state cyber actors that infiltrate and plunder government and private sector computer networks 
with what seems like impunity and with new and creative uh, methods. But no challenge that we face rivals the multifaceted threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party. And so even as we continue to focus on the threats from counterterrorism and from all these other nation states and non-state actors, um, the threat from the Chinese Communist Party is the most significant facing our nation, uh, perhaps uh, in its history. We cannot, in my view, just be the orderly caretakers of our nation's decline. We must confront, and I hope frustrate, the ambitions of the Chinese Communist Party, not just to upend norms, amend boundaries, and re but, but to replace the United States. Their goal is to replace the United States as the world's most powerful and influential nation. And achieving the goal of, of not letting that happen is going to involve strengthening and expanding alliances, but I think it's also going to involve increased capability and a stronger resolve to meet this challenge. This is not the same system of crisis that past CIA leaders were called upon to defend against. The threats today are sudden, unpredictable, and they're happening with greater frequency, often occurring in a gray space that embraces the objectives of conflict without quite, without quite crossing the line into outright warfare. What, what I think is plain to me and should be to all is that the world has changed how it chooses to engage the United States. What I'd like to hear from you today and, and, and if confirmed in the, in the weeks and months to come is whether the CIA needs to change how it engages the world. I hope that over the course of our open and closed sessions today, you'll have to take the opportunity to explain not only your understanding of the agency's unique role in America uh, and in our government, but your vision for how that role needs to evolve in the coming years so that the agency is positioned to defend against those emerging national security threats that have not yet even materialized. There is no disputing the speed and unrivaled capability that the agency can bring to bear in responding uh, to a fully realized national security threat. But what I'm driving at, however, is that an intelligence apparatus oriented towards the technological advances and the global interconnectivity that will be at the core of the next generation of threats to this nation's security. Artificial intelligence, advanced data analytics, biotechnology, disinformation, deep fakes, social network manipulation. America's adversaries have used this and all of these things and will use these instruments and they'll use other new instruments of power and technologies, some who aren't even been named yet, they don't, aren't even, don't even have a name yet, to close the capability gap that has advantaged us as a nation for decades. The refashioning of the national security threat picture by these technological and methodological advances calls into question whether the traditional constructs of espionage need to be refined, re refashioned and redesigned along with it. So I'd welcome your thoughts on this subject both today and going forward and add that this is exactly the kind of undertaking that is benefited by CIA's working partnership with this committee and with its members. So it's my hope and frankly my expectation that you will look at this committee as a partner to the CIA's work as our nation's first line of defense. The relationship between the agency and this committee is premised obviously on oversight but it is most effective and most constructive when we are candid, fulsome, and talking to one another. Ambassador, as the chairman indicated, you have a lengthy and distinguished career of service to our country, and I, I thank you for your willingness to resume that service, and I certainly look forward to your testimony and your answers here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rubio. Bill, I understand you have two of America's most distinguished public servants, former Secretary of State James Baker and former Defense and CIA Director Leon Panetta that will present brief introductions for you. They'll be speaking remotely on your behalf today. So, Secretary Baker, would you like to go first? Thank you, Chairman Warner. Thank you, Vice Chairman Rubio and members of the committee for inviting me to speak today on the nomination of William J. Burns to be director of the Central Intelligence Agency. I am truly honored that Bill asked me to speak on his behalf today and I am delighted to be joined by my old friend, Leon Panetta. Without any reservations, members of the committee, I can strongly recommend Bill Burns to you. Bill, uh, President Biden is to be congratulated for choosing Bill. And my reasoning in this regard is really uh, straightforward. Bill is quite simply one of the finest and most intelligent American diplomats that I had the pleasure of working with. His unique combination of experience, skills, and character make him an outstanding choice for directorship of the CIA. As Secretary of State, I relied on Bill's judgment during one of the most tumultuous eras in U.S. foreign policy. 
He was instrumental in forging effective American policies as we worked to end the Cold War peacefully, ensure the reunification of a Germany firmly embedded in the West, reverse Iraqi aggression against Kuwait, and bring together Israel and all of its neighboring, neighboring Arab states for their first ever face-to-face -face meeting at the 1991 Madrid Peace Conference. Each of these complex situations was challenging, and Bill's contributions made an enormous difference. Bill was there every step of the way, even at times displaying his first-rate sense of humor by laughing at my weak jokes. Bill combined a remarkable ability to grasp broad historical trends while at the same time identifying pragmatic opportunities for the United States to advance our interests. After I left office, I watched Bill rise to ever more senior ranks in the State Department, Executive Secretary, Ambassador to Jordan, Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs, Ambassador to Russia, Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, and then finally, Deputy Secretary of State. I wasn't surprised by his success. He is someone who seizes and surmounts every challenge that he meets. What? Members of the committee, you can be assured when it comes to the security of the United States, our country will be in capable hands. I cannot help but think about another director of central intelligence, President George H.W. Bush, my close friend, who served as head of the agency in the 1970s. President Bush and Bill Burns admittedly represent contrasts in terms of age, background, and career. But they do share one important, indeed essential characteristic, an absolute and abiding sense of responsibility and duty to the United States of America. Bill Burns is a leader and a steady hand under fire. He never hesitates to speak truth, even when he knows it may be unwelcome. He's scrupulously nonpartisan, and he has decades of experience working closely with the CIA and other intelligence agencies. He knows Washington. He knows the world. President Biden and our country would be very fortunate to have Bill Burns at the helm of the Central Intelligence Agency. Distinguished members of the committee, let me close these brief remarks by simply saying that, in my opinion, this confirmation should be a bipartisan no-brainer. Thank you very much for letting me speak to you today on behalf of Bill Burns. Thank you. Well, thank you, Secretary Baker. Very much appreciate those comments. Um, Secretary Panetta? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Warner, uh, Vice Chairman Rubio, uh, distinguished members of the committee, uh, it's an honor for me to once again have the opportunity to appear before this committee that is so critical to protecting our national security. I'm honored to be here alongside my friend, uh, Secretary Jim Baker. He's an old friend and a colleague uh, for many years in government and someone who I believe is probably one of the great statesmen and public servants of our time. I'm proud to join him in introducing the president's nominee to be CIA director, Ambassador Bill Burns. I've known Bill for a long time. Uh, I've been in public life uh, for probably over 50 years. Uh, and I've worked with him in many of those capacities that I've held in Congress, uh, during my tenure as Chief of Staff to President Bill Clinton and as Director of the CIA and Secretary of Defense in the President uh, Obama's administration. The job of leading the extraordinary women and men of the CIA as they carry out their indispensable missions of collection, analysis, covert action, all intended to defend our nation. That job 
I believe is one of the most important responsibilities in government. And the most important qualities that I believe a director should have is to respect and support the professionals in the CIA. They put their lives on the line in order to protect this country and do their jobs. I think it's important for the director to protect them from political influence, to be nonpartisan, and to always, always make sure that the CIA speaks truth to power. Bill Burns has those qualities. He understands the dedication of our brave intelligence officers. He's got the right experience. He's got the right nonpartisan approach. And he knows the importance of protecting our country from our adversaries. In a word, he'll make an outstanding director of the CIA. I don't need to tell this committee and our na that our nation faces an increasingly complex set of challenges and threats. I think in my lifetime, I've never seen as many flashpoints in the world uh, as we have today, whether it's Russia or China or Iran or North Korea, whether it's cyber attacks, whether it's what challenges that we face in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, all of these challenges demand good intelligence. No president, no president can make the right decisions for our nation in protecting our national security without intelligence. This is what the CIA does by collecting and analyzing and presenting intelligence to policymakers so that they can make the best security decisions for the country and provide intelligence that can be trusted and is credible. The challenge of President Biden and a new director is to restore the trust and credibility of the CIA. Having worked with President Biden, I believe that he understands that intelligence must be grounded in facts and never be politicized. He knows our selfless and brave intelligence professionals, and they deserve nothing less than our full support. It's these reasons that he chose Bill Burns to be the CIA director. And I'm confident that both will work to restore trust of the CIA with the national security team, with both Democrats and Republicans on this committee, and with our allies, and most of all, with the American people. As Jim Baker pointed out, Bill has represented our country for decades as a dedicated and honest diplomat serving both Democratic and Republican administrations. Uh, and I won't walk through his career, Jim just did that, but it's been an outstanding foreign policy career. And I have to say it's almost exactly 10 months ago this month, or 10 years ago this month, that Bill and I were in the Situation Room presenting intelligence to the President on the suspected whereabouts of Osama bin Laden. Bill saw the CIA in action, gathering detailed information, providing insights, explaining what we knew and also what we didn't know. And Bill was at the White House on May 1st, 2011, when the courageous mission of our Special Operations Forces unfolded. He was handpicked by the Secretary of State to personally participate in closely held national security discussions about the mission and to place calls to our key allies and foreign leaders informing them of the mission. He's a public servant who has spent his life serving and protecting Americans. And as CIA director, he will certainly speak truth to power because that's what Bill does. And he's done that his entire career. He's long known that calling it down the middle is essential, even when it may not be convenient. He will also make sure 
he and other agency leaders are responsive to oversight by this committee and by the Congress. As all of you know, I'm a big believer that the CIA and this committee, committee have to be partners in order to fulfill the mission of protecting the American people. And he knows the array of challenges that the agency faces, dealing with major competitors, as I said, from China to so many other of those flashpoints I described, and the technological landscape in which our officers now have to operate. In sum, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Vice Chairman and members of the committee, Bill Burns is the right person at the right time to lead the CIA. His experience in foreign policy and national security, his judgment, his unquestioned integrity will be assets as he leads the CIA in facing the threats that we face. And he understands the sacrifices that are, good, that are made by our intelligence professionals, often working in the shadows, in dangerous places, away from their families. He knows that CIA, these officers are silent warriors, officers who put their lives on the line for our country. And I trust Bill Burns to be a director who will have their backs so that they can continue the mission to protect all Americans. As a former director, I am honored to introduce to the committee Bill Burns and urge his swift confirmation. Thank you. Well, thank you, Secretary Panetta. And um, let me just say it's on a personal basis, um, not too bad to have Jim Baker and Leon Panetta be your introducers. So now we'll move to the oath of office. Uh, Ambassador Burns, would you stand? Would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to give this committee the truth, the full truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Please be seated. Before we move to your statement, I will ask you the five standard questions the committee poses to each nominee who appears before us. They just require a simple yes or no answer for the record. First, do you agree to appear before the committee here or in other venues when invited? Yes, sir. If confirmed, do you agree to send officials from your office to appear before the committee and designated staff when invited? Yes. Do you agree to provide documents or other materials requested by the committee in order for it to carry out its oversight and legislative responsibilities? Yes, sir. Will you ensure that your office and your staff provide such materials to the committee when requested? Yes. Do you agree to inform and fully brief to the fullest extent possible all members of this committee of intelligence activities and covert actions rather than only the chairman and vice chairman? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. We'll now proceed to your opening statement. After all, recognize members uh, by order of appearance, but assuming that everybody was here, I think with the exception of Senator Cox at the gavel, so it will be basically seniority. Ambassador Burns, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the committee, I'm honored and humbled to appear before you today as President Biden's nominee for director of the Central Intelligence Agency. I am deeply grateful to the president for the opportunity to return to public service and to lead the remarkable women and men of CIA. If confirmed, I will do everything in my power to justify the trust placed in me and to earn the trust of this committee, Congress, and the American people. I am also deeply grateful to Secretary Baker and Director Panetta two of the finest public servants this country has ever produced for their very generous introductions. My whole life has been shaped by public service. My father, a career army officer, fought in Vietnam in the 1960s and eventually became the director of the US Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. As my three brothers and I bounced from post to post across our remarkable country, I never had to look further than my father for the best possible model of nonpartisan public service. 
and I never had to look further than my mother to find the best imaginable example of selflessness and commitment in a life shaped by faith, family, and hard work. I shared 33 years in the Foreign Service with my wife, Lisa, herself an exceptional public servant, and our two wonderful daughters, Lizzie and Sarah. Their love and support have made everything possible and have enriched my life beyond measure. Across those decades as a diplomat in the Middle East and Russia, and as a senior official in administrations of both parties, I developed enormous respect for my CIA colleagues. I served alongside them in hard places around the world. It was their skill at collection and analysis that often gave me an edge as a negotiator. Their partnership that helped make me an effective ambassador and their insights that helped me make thoughtful choices on the most difficult policy issues. I learned that good intelligence delivered with honesty and integrity is America's first line of defense. I learned that intelligence professionals have to tell policymakers what they need to hear, even if they don't want to hear it. And I learned that politics must stop where intelligence work begins. That is exactly what President Biden expects of CIA. It was the first thing he told me when he asked me to take on this role. He said he wants the agency to give it to him straight, and I pledged to do just that and to defend those who do the same. As the president has emphasized, all of America's national security institutions will have to reimagine their roles on an international landscape that is profoundly different from the world I encountered as a young diplomat nearly 40 years ago, or even the world as it was when I left government six years ago. Today's landscape is increasingly complicated and competitive. It's a world where familiar threats persist, from terrorism and nuclear proliferation to an aggressive Russia, a provocative North Korea, and a hostile Iran. But it's also a world of new challenges in which climate change and global health insecurity are taking a heavy toll on the American people, in which cyber threats pose an ever greater risk to our society, and in which an adversarial predatory Chinese leadership poses our biggest geopolitical test. If confirmed, four crucial and interrelated priorities will shape my approach to leading CIA, China, technology, people, and partnerships. As President Biden has underscored, outcompeting China will be key to our national security in the decades ahead. That will require a long-term, clear-eyed, bipartisan strategy underpinned by domestic renewal and solid intelligence. There will be areas in which it will be in our mutual self-interest to work with China, from climate change to nonproliferation. And I am very mindful that Xi Jinping's China is not without problems and frailties of its own. There are, however, a growing number of areas in which Xi's China is a formidable authoritarian adversary, methodically strengthening its capabilities to steal intellectual property, repress its own people, bully its neighbors, expand its global reach, and build influence in American society. For CIA, that will mean intensified focus and urgency, continually strengthening its already impressive cadre of China specialists, expanding its language skills, aligning personnel and resource allocation for the long haul, and employing a whole of agency approach to the operational and analytical challenges of this crucial threat. Another priority intimately connected to competition with China is technology. As all of you know, as well as I do, the revolution in technology and rapid advances in fields like artificial intelligence are transforming the ways we live, work, fight, and compete. CIA has a rich tradition of innovation, and nothing will matter more to our ability to remain the best intelligence service in the world. CIA will need to relentlessly sharpen its capabilities to understand how rivals use cyber and other technological tools, anticipate, detect, and deter their use, and keep an edge in developing them ourselves. If confirmed, I'll have no higher priority than reinforcing CIA's greatest asset, its people. 
The work of CIA's men and women is often invisible to most Americans, but I have served side by side with them, seeing firsthand their courage, their professionalism, and their sacrifices. I was privileged to be in the White House Situation Room when CIA's brilliant work helped bring Osama bin Laden to justice. But I also remember sadder and harder days, the sorrow and pain after the tragic attack at Khost, and quiet personal moments spent in front of the agency's memorial wall, whose stars include friends with whom I served. Honoring the sacrifice those stars represent means strengthening a workforce worthy of the CIA seal, one that reflects the richness of our society and enables us to carry out our global mission. That means working even harder to enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion from entry level to senior ranks. It means working even harder to retain and develop the agency's extraordinary talent, equipping them with the language skills, technical tools, training, and tradecraft that they require. And it means ensuring the health and well being of colleagues and their families through this awful pandemic and wherever and whenever they face harm or risk. Finally, if confirmed, I'll prioritize partnerships within the intelligence community and across the world. I will work closely with the Director of National Intelligence, my longtime friend and colleague, Avril Haines, to make sure the agency's efforts fit seamlessly with her vision for integrating the intelligence community. America's partnerships and alliances are what set our country apart from lonelier major powers like China and Russia. For CIA, intelligence partnerships are an increasingly important means of amplifying our understanding and influence. Investing in those liaison relationships has never been more important. It's a task for which my whole career has prepared me. No partnership will be more important to me than the one I hope to build with all of you on this committee. In my conversations with each of you over the last few weeks, I have been struck by your commitment to bipartisanship and sense of shared purpose. I deeply respect your crucial oversight role, which allows the American people to have confidence that the agency is working faithfully on their behalf and living up to our values. If confirmed, I promise to do all I can to earn your trust and to be a strong partner. I'll seek your advice as well as your consent, and I'll be accessible and honest, qualities I've tried hard to demonstrate throughout a lifetime in public service. I am deeply honored to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Burns. And for planning purposes, if any members of the committee wish to submit questions for the record after today's hearing, please do so by the close of business on Friday, February 26th. Um, and we'll be going through five-minute rounds. Can you speak with a little more specificity to how we get, you can go about restoring some of the morale of the workforce at the CIA? And what should be, you know, the morale is a, a very old term. Are there measurement techniques or things that we should look to see how the workforce is doing, feeling, operating, you know, three months, six months, a year in? Well, Mr. Chairman, I think in many ways the most important single thing is to reinforce to what I, uh, what I hope are my future colleagues in CIA, if I'm confirmed, that their work matters more than ever, as I tried to describe in my opening statement, that their expertise, their courage, their sacrifices are respected, um, and that, um, as I promised President Biden, um, we will deliver um, unvarnished intelligence, the best possible intelligence we can gather, the most sophisticated all-source analysis, to deliver it to policymakers without any hint of politics or any policy agenda, um, to speak truth to power, just as you rightly emphasized in your own opening comments. That's what President Biden expects of me. That's what I will do to the very best of my ability. And as I said, I will defend all of my colleagues who do exactly the same thing. And I think that's what's crucially important. We, I think the committee, will want to check in on this on a fairly regular basis. I think um, we've heard a number of concerns, that facts that a number of folks, professionals, were leaving. Uh, we've got a 
staunch that flow and, and move forward on that on that issue and related at least. And this has really been a concern of um, Senator Collins, but the whole committee. We've seen evidence now, not just of agency personnel, but State Department personnel and others become victims of mysterious attacks. It was for a while called the Havana Syndrome. And um, a number of us have been quite concerned that we still don't know the source of those attacks. We still don't potentially have a full medical diagnosis. And even though we have put in into law in the last three Intel authorization bills, the ability for the CIA director uh, to provide enhanced benefits to those um, those uh, individuals, uh, you know, the kind of first-rate quality health care and compensation they need and deserve, we're not sure that's really taking place. So I want you to speak to that. I want to make also get a commitment from you that uh, um, that CIA personnel who may have suffered brain injury have the option of treatment at our nation's premier TBI facilities, including Walter Reed and other facilities of highest caliber to date. Unfortunately, uh, that has not been the case. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, the first thing I'd say is I very much admire um, your leadership, the leadership of the Vice Chairman and Senator Collins, as well as other members of the committee on these issues. Um, not only do I admire and appreciate it, but I know it's deeply appreciated by the women and men of CIA. Um, if I'm confirmed as Director of CIA, I will have no higher priority than taking care of people, of colleagues and their families. And I do commit to you that if I'm confirmed, um, I will make it a, a, an extraordinarily high priority um, to get to the bottom of who's responsible for the attacks that you just described and to ensure that colleagues and their families get the care that they deserve, including at the National Institutes of Health and at Walter Reed. Um, and I look forward very much to working with all of you to ensure that that's the case. My last question is, this committee, under the leadership of Senator Burr and Senator Rubio, in many ways, I think, carved out the role of the technology committee on the Hill. And we really were the group that first raised the concerns about China's technological advances. Uh, we were the committee that um, called into question and then tried to formulate across government a 5G response. This issue of technology advancement, and as Senator Rubio pointed out, China doesn't have the goal of competing with us, they have the, of, uh, they have the goal of beating us in technological advancement. And I just want to, you may want to comment on this briefly, but continuing CIA's role to monitor China's advancement in all these technology fields, not simply a CIA directive, but we really do think the intelligence community has a broader view on this, on this issue than any other part of our government. No, it, it's hugely important, Mr. Chairman, and as I tried to emphasize in my opening statement, that connection between dealing with an adversarial China and ensuring that we can continue to compete effectively in technology is right at the top of my list of priorities if I'm confirmed. And I do respect the role of this committee. I watched the open hearing yesterday on, on solar winds, and it seemed to me to be a, a classic illustration of the value of um, a serious committee in looking at these issues, and I look forward very much to working with all of you on that. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Ambassador, let me, you know, in your written questions, you acknowledge that China uses cultural and educational programs, things like the Confucius Institutes and others, to try to influence U.S. policy based debates to spread pro-China propaganda. So, uh, given this acknowledgement, I wanted to focus a little bit on your time as the president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Now, Carnegie is involved with the China-United States Exchange Foundation, uh, an organization that you acknowledged in, in your written question or answers. Uh, it's part of China's United Front system, which is an effort to co-opt and neutralize sources of potential opposition and part of their efforts to encourage foreign countries to adopt positions and narratives supportive of Beijing's uh, preferred, uh, preferred policies. And, and in, in this work at the endowment, it's reported that in 2019, you invited 11 uh, congressional staffers on a trip to China. They met with a professor who works for the Communist Party Central Committee. They met with the president of another front group. 
for the Chinese Communist Party, a group that was designated last October by the State Department as a group that seeks to directly uh, influence, uh, and actually the quote is sought to directly and malignly influence state and local leaders in the United States. And um, the, the, this group that you partner with, you know, the China-United States Exchange Foundation, a congressionally appointed committee, a commission in August of 2018 said that they showed a clear intent to influence policy towards China in the United States. So given your stated concerns about Chinese soft power influence efforts, why, at, while you were at the helm, did Carnegie Endowment for International Peace establish a relationship with and accept funding from, from this group, this China-United States Exchange Foundation? Well, thanks, Senator Rubio, for the question. I mean, the first thing I'd emphasize is the Carnegie Endowment is a proudly independent and transparent organization and scrupulous about ensuring that whatever financial support it receives, whether it's from trustees or foundations, doesn't in any way shape the content or the conclusions of scholarly work at Carnegie. That's first. Second, on the China-U.S. Exchange Foundation, uh, this is a relationship that I inherited when I became president of Carnegie and that I ended not long after I became president, precisely for the concerns that you just described, because we were increasingly worried about the expansion of Chinese influence operations. Shortly after I ended that relationship, we began a program at the Carnegie Endowment on countering foreign influence operations, which was aimed mostly at China and Russia, um, and was supported in part from a grant from the Global Engagement Center at the State Department in the last administration. On, on the second issue, um, Senator Rubio, that you raised on the congressional staff delegation, in 2019, we did partner with the Aspen Institute, which, as you know, for decades, under the leadership of Dan Glickman, former Congressman Dan Glickman, um, has managed both member and staff delegations to many different parts of the world. Um, this was a trip that included senior staff members, both Republicans and Democrats, both from the House and the Senate. It was fully approved in advance by the House Ethics Committee. And in my view, as an illustration of what an institution like Carnegie should do, which is to provide congressional staff members with an opportunity to engage directly with Chinese counterparts and to express their concerns about Chinese actions and malign behavior quite directly. So in that sense, I think, you know, it was a good illustration of what a non-governmental institution like Carnegie working with the Aspen Institute can do. But I share your concerns about foreign influence operations. And as I said, we've tried to demonstrate in our work at Carnegie over the time that I was president, our appreciation of that threat. My second and final question is, about, you know, Tsinghua University has been designated by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute as a very high risk for its level of defense research and alleged involvement in cyber attacks. At Carnegie, while you were there, worked with Tsinghua University to set up the Carnegie Tsinghua Center in Beijing, a center that features seven individuals who work at the university as its guiding scholars uh, who uh, have ties to the Communist Party. Two of the center's senior fellows serve in senior Chinese Communist Party roles. And, and the center partnered with the Center for China and Globalization, a Beijing think tank associated and linked to the Communist Party's, uh, whose president is linked to the Communist Party's efforts uh, via the, uh, he plays a prominent role with the United Front, uh, which, is the, which is a group that Xi Jinping has called China's secret weapon. I'm curious, uh, what conditions, restrictions did the Chinese impose in order for this center to be set up? Well, well uh, Senator Ruber, you're right. I mean, the, the center that Carnegie operates uh, in Beijing and has for more than a decade is a partnership with Tsinghua University. Um, during my time as president, I was extraordinarily careful to ensure that the arrangements that we had as a non-governmental organization operating there allowed us to continue to do independent work. And that has been the case over the last six years. I've also made clear to my colleagues um, at Carnegie that the moment we were constrained in doing that independent work, we would cease operations, because our point is not simply to exist. Carnegie's point is not to exist in centers in different parts of the world, it's to do high quality independent work. When that becomes impossible, or you know, our scholars are self-censoring, 
then that's the moment at which it becomes no longer feasible to operate there. Thank you. Senator Feinstein. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you know, <coughs> excuse me, over a decade ago, um, Mr. Burns, the CIA engaged in the use of waterboarding and other so-called enhanced uh, interrogation techniques during interrogations. You provided straightforward answers in the pre-hearing questions, and I appreciate that. But I want to cover this topic because I believe it remains a priority to ensure that we never return to this. So let me ask you the same types of questions that I asked Director Coates, Pompeo, and Haspel when they were before us. Do you agree that current law prohibits any interrogation techniques not allowed by the United States Army Field Manual on Interrogation? Um, Senator Feinstein, it's good to see you. Um, I believe that waterboarding does constitute uh, torture under the law. Um, as you well know, this, the, the issue of the enhanced interrogation techniques has been a settled matter for more than a decade. Uh, they were prohibited by President Obama in 2009, and then under the leadership of Senator McCain, the Congress um, enshrined this in legislation to ensure that the only permissible interrogation methods were those allowed in the Army Field Manual. Um, I think it's fair to say we all learned some very hard lessons in the period after 9-11. It is very important, it's crucial to be mindful of those lessons and to move forward. And so it's in that spirit that I, I also share Director Haynes's view that um, we should not take actions against or prejudice the careers of officers who may have worked under, in those programs at a time when they were operating under Department of Justice guidelines and at the direction of the president. So to answer your question specifically again, I, I am certainly committed to what the law uh, provides right now and to ensuring that those enhanced interrogation methods are never again used by CIA. They certainly will not be under my leadership if I'm confirmed. Well, thank you very much for that answer. It certainly was fulsome, and I greatly respect the fact that you came forward with it in the way in which you did. Um, as noted in the intelligence community statement for the record um, in 2019, and our most recent worldwide threats assessment hearing, China has the ability to launch cyber attacks that cause localized temporary disruptive effects on critical infrastructure, natural gas pipeline, pipelines for days or weeks, and Russia has the ability to execute cyber attacks in the United States that generate localized temporary disruptive effects on critical infrastructure, electrical distribution network for at least a few hours, and so on. I am concerned by this and want to know how we address this threat. So here's the question. What do you believe is the appropriate role for the CIA in diminishing these types of cyber threats to our critical infrastructure? And what else could the CIA be doing to help ensure the integrity of national cyber security? Well, thanks, Senator. As the, the hearing that um, this committee conducted yesterday underscored, uh, the solar winds attack, that cyber attack, um, was a very harsh wake-up call, I think, for all of us about the vulnerabilities of supply chains and critical infrastructure in both the private sector and the public sector in this country. And we've seen in recent years how both the Chinese leadership as well as the Russian leadership um, have an aggressive determination to take advantage of those vulnerabilities. I first saw this when I was ambassador in Moscow in 2007, and the Russians staged, Vladimir Putin's Russia, staged a very determined cyber attack on Estonia, a small NATO ally of the United States. So if this is a harsh wake-up call, then I think it's essential for the CIA in particular to work even harder to develop our capabilities to um, help detect um, these kind of attacks um, when they come from external players, from foreign players, which is the responsibility of the CIA, to help attribute those because without attribution, it's very difficult to deter future attacks. 
um, continue to develop our own technological and cyber capabilities as a part of that potential deterrence, and then at the same time, to deepen partnerships across the intelligence community with domestic agencies like FBI and the Department of Homeland Security, with the private sector, where there's a shared interest in helping to shore up these vulnerabilities in critical infrastructure, and then finally, and not least, with foreign partners as well, many of whom, as I mentioned in the case of Estonia, have faced these same kind of threats where we can learn from their experience and working together not only build better defenses, but also begin to build leverage against adversaries. And over time, I've been convinced, work with like-minded countries, allies and partners, not only to build leverage, but to build rules of the road that help protect critical infrastructure, that help make clear international understandings that certain kinds of critical infrastructure are off limits for those kind of cyber attacks. That'll take time, it'll take enormous effort, but I think the CIA and intelligence can be an important part of that effort. Thank you very Senator much. Burke. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador, welcome. Good uh, to see you, sir. Hard to believe that we have known each other for over a quarter century. <laughs> and I'm sure uh, as you drove to the Hill today, it reminded you of some of the battle zones you've served in. <laughs> You've not been given vacation spots uh, at your time at the State Department. And I think this committee is grateful to you for your service up till now, and more importantly, for what you're about to embark on. Uh, Bill, as you know, <clears throat> it's difficult for federal, federal agencies to recruit talent today. It's particularly difficult at an agency that requires security clearances. Uh, do you have any idea today how you might want to restructure the recruitment process so that you can begin to onboard people, people earlier. It's difficult to recruit out of a university, a graduate, and say, we've got a job for you, but in a year after you've cleared security clearance, uh, do you see a need to, to revamp that in a way that allows you to bring that talent in? Um, Senator Burr, yes, I do, and I, I've seen this through my own experience at another agency at the State Department, the price that you pay when security clearance processes drag on and on. You lose good people. It becomes very difficult to recruit the kind of workforce, particularly a diverse workforce, that CIA requires um, to be effective. And so one of my high priorities, if I'm confirmed, will be to take a hard look at that issue. I know work has gone on in the past on this. I know previous directors have worked hard at this issue, but I agree with you on its significance. And you can't, you can't hope to have effective recruitment processes unless we find a way to streamline that process. Well, the chairman's been outspoken on it, and I'm sure he will be dogged as it relates to uh, uh, the way forward. Ambassador, you speak three languages. Talk to us about how you see uh, uh, language requirements within the agency um, going forward. Uh, is it a priority? It, it has to be a priority, Senator. I know it was a priority for Gina Haspel as well, and I greatly respect that. Human intelligence um, cuts right to the core of CIA's unique role and responsibilities, and a part of gathering that human intelligence, um, which complements technical means that CIA and other parts of the intelligence community have uh, you know, made enormous progress on in recent years, but they're not a substitute for human intelligence. A part of that collection effort has to require, does require a facility uh, in foreign languages. And so, as I discussed when I was talking about the high priority that I, I would attach to China, if I'm confirmed as director, a part of that intelligence, a part of that priority um, requires um, expanding the number of uh, Mandarin language speakers at CIA and making that a priority um, and continuing to work to expand other hard language facility at the agency. It's crucially important. You've heard and you will hear members on this committee all talk about technology. And I think most of us would agree that the United States is retarded as it relates to our ability to adapt new technologies. We're slow, we fight it. Um, the reason that 
many of our adversaries have made the gains that they have is because of their willingness to accept technology, to use technology, to leverage that against what we've built. How do you intend to use technology both in the workforce and in the trade craft to make sure that we fully take advantage of what I think is the greatest innovative country in the world? Well, Senator, I think you're exactly right. I mean, you know, CIA has a, a rich history of innovation and agility in technology, but if I'm confirmed, I recognize that we're going to have to work even harder to be innovative and to be agile. You mentioned tradecraft. One of the big challenges today in operational tradecraft is ubiquitous technical surveillance, the capacity of a number of our adversaries um, to make it much more comp complicated to conduct traditional tradecraft. And so the agency, like so many other parts of the U.S. government, is going to have to adapt um, to that kind of a challenge. I'm entirely confident that the women and men of CIA are capable of that. It's also going to require, Senator, this is the one point I would add, um, you know, a, a greater effort to work with the private sector as well um, so that we can not only keep pace with technological progress, but get out ahead of it. That's exactly what our adversaries are doing, and that's what I think we need to put even greater effort into as well. Ambassador, let me remind you that the two introductions that were made for you, one thing they both highlighted, the need for the partnership with this committee and with the CIA. I know you embrace that fully, and for that, we're grateful. I look forward to your confirmation. Thank you, sir. I look forward Thank to you. it as well. Thank Senator White. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ambassador, at the risk of this becoming a full-fledged bouquet-tossing contest, I want to just register a couple of areas that uh, you've been involved in that are especially important to me. Your uh, track record on human rights is, I think, a real attribute for this job, and of course your experience at the State Department. It is rare that we see people with that kind of background. So we're very appreciative of having you here. Let me start, and I think we touched on it, um, with respect to this matter of correcting false statements. If you or any other CIA official says something publicly that is inaccurate, will you correct the public record? Um, well, Senator, as, as we discussed, um, I believe it's a serious responsibility if I'm confirmed as CIA director um, to, if in the case of a policymaker making a statement that, um, that I judge later to be at variance with um, intelligence that we've provided, to work with that policymaker to try to correct that statement and to get it right. I, I think, as you well know, Senator, that cuts right to the core of building credibility and building trust um, which are the foundations, I think, for sound policy choices as well. So I would certainly take that very seriously in doing everything I can to correct the record. Very good. So my second question um, deals with this co question of technology, and I'm glad that you've staked out the ground that will be prior a priority um, for you. Uh, a major technology challenge will be to uh, protect sources and methods while not hiding the legal interpretations that are used to conduct operations. And I'm especially troubled by situations in which the government goes around the courts and buys Americans' private records from data brokers, people who are basically unregulated. It's one of the sleaziest operations I know of, and I'm actually introducing legislation uh, the Fourth Amendment is not for sale here very shortly. We talked about this uh, with uh, Director Haynes at her confirmation uh, process, and I would like to ask you whether you would uh, make public the circumstances under which the intelligence community, and under, excuse me, under which the CIA, as part of the intelligence community, purchases commercially available information and the legal basis for doing so. Um, yes, Senator, I share Director Haynes's view that it would be very valuable to lay out a framework that makes clear to the American people um, the guidelines and the legal boundaries um, within which we would undertake those activities. So I'm a strong believer in transparency, and I, I share Director Haynes's commitment. Now, with respect to accountability, in 2013, the CIA acknowledged that it had fallen short in holding people accountable for failures associated 
with the management of the torture program. And I want to use my words carefully here because this has been a subject of some debate. So my question is, the CIA then recommended, and I believe what the discussion was about was going forward, that it broaden accountability reviews to consider systemic problems and officers responsible for those systemic problems as well as management failures. So this was a recommendation of a long time ago, 2013. Do you agree with the CIA's 2013 recommendation and will you implement it so that going forward, everybody is clear about uh, the fact that it will be followed? I, I will, Senator. Um, I attach great importance to accountability. I will certainly follow through on that if I'm confirmed as director. And I do think it's important in conducting accountability review processes to also look at ways in which you can address systemic problems as well. I think that's constructive. And I want to work with you on the timeline because, and this will be something we'll talk about on another occasion, but since it was recommended in 2013. That's been a long time. We've got to get it done. Last question is, over the years, the CIA has at times impeded congressional oversight by limiting briefings to the so-called Gang of Eight, limiting staff access to important programs and operations, and failing to inform the committee at all. Uh, will you conduct a thorough review of where the CIA has engaged in any of these practices and report back to the full committee so that all of us, every member, will know how uh, access can be expanded? Well, Senator, I, if I'm confirmed, I certainly will be committed to trying to provide um, as much information as possible to the broader committee on sensitive operations and collection. And I do commit um, to reviewing the practices of my predecessors with regard to what information was restricted to Gang of Eight um, and to working with all of you on this committee on that issue. Good. I just want to tell my colleagues I'll be supporting Ambassador Burns and look forward to working with him. Senator Collins. I'm sorry. Did you come? Senator, we were going uh, by order of arrival at the, at the gavel. Thank you. Ambassador Burns, welcome. Thank you. I first want to express my appreciation to you for engaging in an extensive conversation with me about the CIA officials who have been the subject of these terrible attacks that have left them with, in some cases, permanent traumatic brain injuries. And I was very glad that both the chairman and the ranking member, the vice chairman brought up this issue to you. I know that we have your firm commitment to ensure that those who have been injured receive the best possible, best possible medical care uh, without going through hassles and roadblocks. And I hope we also have your commitment to focus on identifying the perpetrator of these heinous attacks. Um, Senator, I, I very much appreciate that, our earlier conversation on these issues as well. And I just reemphasize my commitment on both of those counts to doing everything I can, if I'm confirmed as director, to help get to the bottom of who's responsible for those attacks. And Ambassador second, Burns, could you, could you get your mic a little bit closer? Sure. Is that better? Thanks. Yes. Um, and, and commit not only to trying to get to the bottom of who's responsible, um, but also to ensure that my future colleagues get the care that they and their families deserve, whether it's at Walter Reed or National Institute of Health or elsewhere. And I look forward very much to working with you on those issues. And I know there are a range of other issues affecting the care and well-being of my future colleagues, those who, for example, have served as paramilitary officers over the course of recent years and have made enormous sacrifices in the last two decades, who also face genuine health challenges. And, and I also commit to trying to ensure that they get the best care possible as well. Thank you. Uh, in the questions for the record, 
you were asked about the Confucius Institutes that are on um, some of our college campuses. And I was pleased to see that you agree that the Chinese Communist Party uses these institutes as an instrument for propaganda. Uh, two questions. First, could you elaborate on how uh, the Chinese Communist Party uses these Confucius Institutes uh, to advance its goals? And second, what would be your advice to any college campus that is still hosting a Confucius Institute? Um, Senator, thanks for the question. I mean, I think, you know, what the Confucius Institutes do, and I'm no expert on them, but is to promote a narrative of uh, Xi Jinping's China, um, which is designed to build sympathy um, for, you know, what is, in my view, a, a quite aggressive um, uh, leadership which is engaged in conduct and conducted, you know, an adversarial approach to relations with the United States. So in that sense, that particular dimension of foreign influence operations um, constitutes a genuine risk. And so, you know, my advice for any institutions in the United States, including uh, academic institutions, is to be extraordinarily careful of, you know, what the motives are. Um, for a variety of institutions like that, and to be very careful um, in engaging them. Would you recommend that they shut them down? I mean, if I, if I were a president of, you know, a college or university and had a Confucius Institute, that's certainly what I would do. Thank you. Senator Heinrich. Thank you, Chairman. Welcome, Ambassador. Uh, Hi, Senator. Thanks for the time that we were able to connect earlier. Um, you know, you've been a customer of the CIA's intelligence for many years in your various roles at state. Um, so you're no stranger to the agency, to the value that it brings. Uh, but if you're confirmed, you'll be the first, and it looks like you're off to a good start, by the way, but you'll be the first career diplomat to serve as director of the agency. Um, so you'll be in a really good position to help ensure that good intelligence is in the service of good policy. So talk to us a little about, at the 30,000-foot level, just how you intend to leverage your diplomatic experience in this new role that is very different from what you did before. Well, thanks very much, Senator, and I, I enjoyed our earlier conversation as well. Um, as you said, I've had long experience both in the field and in senior policy-making jobs in Washington in working with the CIA, and I absolutely agree with you that good intelligence delivered with honesty and integrity is the critical foundation for sound policy choices. I had a very positive experience as a chief of mission working overseas, working with um, intelligence colleagues, um, you know, they understood that as the chief of mission, I was the president's representative on the ground. I led country teams, which in the case, for example, of Moscow, when I was ambassador there from 2005 to 2008, was still one of our biggest embassies in the world. There were more than two dozen agencies in that country team. So they understood, CIA station chief did, um, their obligation to keep me uh, fully and currently informed. In return, um, I respected their professionalism and trusted it, and I didn't micromanage. I can't remember one instance when I was a chief of mission, either in Moscow or in Jordan, where we had to elevate an issue because we had a difference to Washington. Now, when I was deputy secretary of state, there were several instances, not a large number, where differences between a chief of mission and a chief of station um, were raised to my level. And, and I was able to work out with my counterpart, the deputy director of CIA, in virtually all of those instances, a reasonable approach. I, I can count on less than one hand the number of times we had to elevate that even higher. So I, I raise that only because I think there's no substitute in the end for good leadership and professionalism and trust in making that relationship work. Um, and in understanding the critical role of unvarnished intelligence in the policymaking process. I, I think that's a helpful answer in, in setting up my next question as well, which is, 
Um, this is a remarkable agency. It has some of the most talented people um, in service to our country of any agency in existence. Um, but as I mentioned in our recent conversation, when, when things do get awry, sometimes uh, it is because of things that are inherent to the culture of the agency. Uh, it can be resistant to change, resistant to transparency, um, not always welcoming of outsiders. Um, and you told me you were familiar with this concern from your, your time working the, uh, with the agency overseas. I, I'm just curious, if you're confirmed, how would you approach, um, especially as an outsider, the, the cultural challenges that can be inherent in uh, an agency like this? Well, I'm certainly familiar with, you know, the cultural, um, you know, identity of different institutions. I mean, my old institution, the State Department, has its own share of tribalism and cultural challenges to be overcome. It's not a perfect institution either. I have enormous respect for career public servants, whether it's at state or, or now, I hope, at CIA. And, you know, you have to understand um, what drives different professionals in an organization. Um, you know, if, if, you know, if you're a case officer overseas, that requires an enormous amount of professional skill and courage and creativity as well. And that's a huge asset for the promotion of American interests around the world. Analysts at CIA are noted for their honesty, for their willingness to speak truth to power. And that's why it's so essential for a director to have their backs and to defend them when they do that and to make sure that we're trying to get the best out of all of those different roles at the agency, to keep pace with technological change as well, which is another of the great assets, I think, of CIA, um, and to be able to integrate all of those skills and all of those cultures in a way that serves the national interest, and that's what I'll be determined to do. Senator Bond. Uh, th thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Senator Heinrich. I was going to cover exactly those two topics, understanding the building. I, I did read in some of the articles on this, uh, the CIA agents you had worked with over the years were incredibly confident that as a consumer of this information, you'd bring a lot to the job. I think uh, Robert Richard said uh, Burns knows the building, and, and I think your response to Senator Heinrich uh, suggests that you've thought more about the conversation we had uh, about the importance of being engaged in the in that culture in an imminent way. I'm, I'm wondering, Ambassador, as maybe the person who's cons who's been the, the the biggest consumer of CIA uh, assistance and information, who would have ever had this job, how would you think that would impact you structuring? how the product comes out and how the agency works as it relates to thinking about the real ultimate goal of the information is not for the CIA to make any decision, but to get it to the consumer in a way that uh, an ambassador or uh, somebody in the administration or a member of Congress can fully understand uh, the information in the best possible way. Well, thanks so much, Senator, because it cuts right to the core of what my responsibilities will be if I'm confirmed. Um, you know, as a, as a senior policymaker and consumer of intelligence from the CIA, what mattered most to me was that I get their honest judgment on issues, e even when it might be inconvenient or unwelcome in some ways because it just complicated what was an already complicated set of policy choices. But I, what, what I learned, sometimes the hard way over my career, is an, unless you're getting unvarnished intelligence without a hint of politics or policy agenda, it becomes impossible to have an effective policy process. You also want to get it as quickly as you can. Um, you know, with regard, for example, to issues of attribution, whether there is a cyber threat like the one the committee was discussing yesterday, being able to get to the bottom of that is absolutely crucial to trying to sort through policy choices as well. Um, so, so I think that the better the connection in a way between policymakers who understand um, what it takes to produce high quality intelligence and produce it in a timely way, 
and intelligence professionals who understand what policymakers are wrestling with as they try to sort through what are almost inevitably a set of unappealing choices, I think that, that becomes crucial um, to an effective process. I think this has already come up before, but I think you want to be sure that uh, this committee becomes an informed ally in the effort to be sure that the uh, artificial intelligence, the machine learning, uh, helps you, is adequate to get things narrowed down to where an individual should be looking at them. There's more and more information uh, all the time, uh, and how you get that information to the point where you, you can, in your very best possible way, analyze it's going to be, I think, increasingly important. Uh, you know, we first met when you were in Moscow and the ambassador there. How do you think your understanding of Moscow, of, of, of Russia, of, of Putin uh, is going to be helpful as you advise both this committee and the president? Well, thanks, Senator Blunt. And I remember fondly our, our meeting now almost 15 years ago, I think, in Moscow. Um, you know, most of my white hair uh, came from my service in, in Russia over the years, and in particular in dealing with Vladimir Putin's Russia. What I've learned is that it's always a mistake to underestimate Putin's Russia, that while Russia may be in many ways a declining power, it can be at least as disruptive under Putin's leadership as rising powers like China. Um, and so we have to be quite cold-eyed in our view of how those threats can emerge. Um, and I, what I've also learned, even though I will set aside my former policymaker role, is that in dealing with those threats, um, responding to them and deterring them, firmness and consistency is hugely important. And it's also very important to work to the maximum extent possible with allies and partners. We have more effect sometimes on Putin's calculus when he sees responses coming, firm responses coming not just from the United States, but from our European allies and others as well. So it, it pays off to work hard at widening that circle of countries who are going to push back. Well, thank you, Ambassador. I look forward to supporting uh, your nomination and to your, the relationship when you're confirmed that you'll have with this committee, which is incredibly important for us, and I hope it turns out to be equally important for you. I look forward to it, Senator. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Senator King uh, on WebEx. Mr. Ambassador, welcome to the committee. Uh, Hi, Senator. It's, it's great to be with you, and I realized when you were being introduced today that you and I had something in common. Uh, both of us took the foreign service exam some decades ago. The only difference was that you passed and I didn't, but we won't uh, dwell on that. Uh, but I appreciate having you here. There's been a lot of talk today, rightly so, about uh, truth to power. And sometimes that sounds too easy. And my concern is it's not, it, it's more subtle than somebody mendaciously doctoring intelligence or changing it, it's human nature to want to tell the boss what they want to hear. And so the, the question is, how do we, how do we build a, a structure uh, to be sure that that is the ongoing policy uh, and that we don't slip into a kind of comfortable relationship with the president or this committee or the secretary of defense where uh, it's more of an unconscious process, but the result is the same, biased intelligence that will undermine good decision making. Give me some thoughts on that, please. Well, Senator King, um, it, it's good to see you. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, speaking truth to power has to be more than a slogan. And it is often easier said than done. Um, you know, I think the, the tone gets set at the top I've known President Biden for a quarter century and have great respect for him. And when he told me in literally almost the first thing he said when he asked me to take on this role, that he expected me and CIA to deliver intelligence to him straight, I know that he meant it. And I, and I think setting that tone at the top is crucially important. I know it be, can become difficult in the press of crises and policy making um, to lose sight of the importance of delivering unadulterated intelligence judgments. And it's important to remain mindful of that over time and be reminded of it, as I know all of you on this committee will remind me. 
All I can say is that I'm acutely aware of the importance of playing that role. I know it's a different role than the one I've paid in, played in the past as a policymaker or as an ambassador overseas, but I look forward to it because I do understand from those perspectives how crucial it is to have intelligence, the best possible intelligence that CIA can collect, delivered with honesty and integrity, and that's what I intend to do. In order to effectuate that, I hope that you will provide strong support to the Ombudsman program, to the analytical integrity program uh, that's ongoing, uh, so that uh, the, the commitment you have from the president extends throughout the agency. To follow up, in your memoir in 2019, you said that your greatest professional regret was your failure to effectively communicate your concerns prior to the 2003 uh, invasion of Iraq. It seems to me that's an example of, of exactly what we're talking about. Share that uh, experience, if you would. Sure. Um, well, first, Senator, I do agree with you on the important role that the ombudsman plays, and if I'm confirmed as director, I will do everything I can to defend and strengthen that role, because it does give analysts uh, an opportunity if they have concerns about pressures or politicization to, to raise them as well. Um, I, I tried to write honestly in the memoir that I published a couple of years ago about my experience when I was serving as the head of the Near East Bureau in the State Department for Colin Powell, a leader for whom I have enormous respect, um, in the run-up to the Iraq War. And what I tried to do along with my colleagues was to be honest about concerns that we had about how complicated the day after in Iraq would be, even if the U.S. military successfully overthrew Saddam Hussein, which I didn't doubt would be the case. Um, a couple of colleagues of mine and I, Ryan Crocker, who later became U.S. ambassador in the hardest places around the world, and David Pierce, wrote a memo um, in the summer of 2002 to Secretary Powell, which we entitled The Perfect Storm. And we tried imperfectly to lay out our concerns about everything that could go wrong uh, in the run-up to the war in Iraq and on the days after. It was imperfect. We got it about half right and half wrong in terms of you know, many of the problems we tried to identify. But I mention it only because it was an honest effort to express our concerns. And I think that's what's incumbent, whether you're in a policy-making role, as I was then at the State Department, or in a senior intelligence role, is to be straightforward about your concerns. Because without that, policy choices suffer. Exactly. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador. And I, I also will join my colleagues. I look forward to working with you. And you, the, re the relationship with this committee is very important because separately from all other agencies, most other agencies, the U.S. government, uh, nobody's watching uh, the CIA except us. And therefore, you've got to uh, be as open as possible with us so that we can uh, meet our responsibility to the American people uh, to be sure that uh, this secret organization, which is sort of an anomaly in a, in a democracy, is, uh, is being overseen and, and supervised by uh, elected representatives. So I look forward to working with you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I do too, Senator King. I, mean, I just want to make clear for members uh, the procedure we were operating with today, I know it was a little different than the past. We were doing questions in order of seniority among those present when, when the hearing was gaveled to order. Senator Cornyn. Mr. Ambassador, uh, thank you for uh, saying yes to President Biden and uh, congratulations on, and uh, again, thank you for assuming this uh, important role. Um, I can't think of anybody that has the breadth of experience that you've had in the world, um, which leads me just to, a, I'm just kind of curious. I know you've been exposed to a lot of foreign intelligence services yes, sir. over your 34 years or so in, in the foreign service. Are there intelligence services around the world, any of them that sort of stand out as having uh, what you believe would be uh, commendable? Um, organizations or operations or structures that's something that uh, the United States government ought to consider in terms of structuring, organizing, or operating our intelligence services? 
Well, I think there are a number of intelligence services, especially amongst our allies and partners that I've admired over the years. Again, I've been looking at it from the perspective of a diplomat. Certainly, British intelligence service, the French, some of our closest European allies, I think, are, are first-rate partners. Certainly, the Israeli intelligence services I've known over the years are extremely capable and have also, I think, worked hard on the technology issue that we were discussing before, which is extremely important. We've also had intelligence services who are close partners in the in the war on terrorism, you know, over the last 20 years, that whose capabilities, I think, at least in my experience, um, have been enhanced over recent years, sometimes because of the cooperation with U.S. intelligence services, and that's, that's going to be extremely important moving forward. So I think there's something we can learn from those intelligence services, and we also have to pay very careful attention um, to the capabilities of our adversaries as well, whether it's the Russian intelligence services, which I've had experience with over the years, or Chinese intelligence services as well. It's important not to underestimate them. They're putting a great deal of effort into technological development, and we see that on the part of you know, smaller adversarial intelligence services, whether it's the Iranians or, or others as well. So it's, it's important not to underestimate their capabilities and learn where we can. On another topic, uh, one of the things we learned from this pandemic is our uh, vulnerability uh, to supply chains uh, from overseas. And I think you and I may have talked a little bit about uh, my interest along with Chairman Warner and actually Senator Cotton and the, the whole Congress really now in uh, reshoring our ability to uh, manufacture for the, the most sophisticated semiconductors. Um, China, I understand, is building about 16 fabs, uh, while the Taiwan Semiconductor is planning on building uh, one in Arizona. Uh, but uh, we need to approach, I think, some of these national security challenges we have in China in a different way. What I mean by that is that we, um, we're so ossified and stovepiped here in Congress in terms of the way we do things, let's say the appropriations process, if it came to providing some sort of financial incentive uh, for the development of some technology like, well, like a semiconductor fab, um, that doesn't quite fit very well into our structure of appropriations and budget caps and subcommittee appropriations and the like. Uh, but I wish you would work with us and give some thought, not only to what those vulnerabilities are and how we rack them and stack them and address them in terms of the priorities, and the vulnerability that currently exists, but um, help us find ways to uh, uh, perhaps modify, change, reform, or just adapt uh, to the new uh, competition we have with China, where they're investing billions of dollars in everything from 5G to AI to quantum computing and others, and we can't afford to let them win. Um, do you, uh, will you uh, commit to working with us on that challenge? No, I certainly will, Senator, and I do admire the work that you and Senator Cotton and others have done um, over the course of recent months and years to highlight that problem, supply chain vulnerability. Semiconductors, as you mentioned, is a classic illustration of that as well. And uh, not only do I look forward to working with you on those issues, but I promise it'll be a high priority at CIA if I'm confirmed to understand from the perspective we bring from abroad, the ways in which some of our adversaries and rivals can take advantage of those vulnerabilities, and then through intelligence partnerships with some of our allies and partners to look at ways in which we can coordinate efforts to shore up supply chains as well, because it's not a vulnerability that's unique to the United States, as, as you well know, Senator. So no, I'll look forward very much to working with you on that. If the chairman will indulge me, let me just ask one Final, final Short question, question because on nuclear proliferation. Yes, sir. Do you think Iran can ever be trusted with a nuclear weapon? No, sir. No, I think it's absolutely important for the United States to continue to do everything we can to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. Thank you very much. Senator Bennett. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ambassador, for your willingness to serve. We are very, very grateful that you're coming back. Um, you had uh, mentioned uh, that enhanced competition with an increasingly threatening Chinese Communist Party constitutes one of our greatest long-term challenges. As 
Chairman Warner said the committee has been closely tracking China's assertive moves from aggressive investments in port infrastructure on some of the world's most strategic coasts to exploitation of illiberal surveillance regimes to investments intended to put our advantages in space at risk. In addition to China, you listed off, I think, nuclear proliferation, climate, global health, technology, as things where we need a long-term, you said, I think, a long-term clear-eyed approach. And you have worked in these in countries with authoritarian regimes. We obviously are a democracy. It was poignant, I think, to see those two luminaries introduce you this morning because a reminder of a time when people actually could find a way to work together in this democracy. And I wanted to ask you your thoughts about how you, as the director of the CIA, could elevate the view a little bit here to make sure that, you know, we're looking out 10 years and 20 years instead of just between the commercial breaks on the cable television at night. How do we, as a democracy, competing in a world with totalitarian societies, um, uh, uh, seize an opportunity here uh, to, to actually compete and win and succeed? Um, I'd just be interested in your perspective about how, sure. you, how you can help us elevate our view. Well, Senator, first, first I think it is important to approach all of those formidable challenges you just described with a sense of confidence. Because while I recognize that the international landscape is changing fast, we're in a period of profound transformation. The United States may no longer be the singular dominant player we were when I worked for Secretary Baker 30 years ago. But I would still argue we have a better hand to play than any of our major rivals. And that's because of our capacity for domestic renewal, which I know has been tested in recent years, but it's hugely important and it sets our, us apart from authoritarian regimes around the world. And second is our capacity to draw on allies and partners, which also sets us apart from lonelier powers like China and Russia today. The second thing I'd stress, just to pick up your point, is it is important as pressing as immediate crises and immediate threats always are at the CIA or anywhere else in the U.S. government, you have to be able to look over the horizon a little bit. You, you mentioned one very good example of that, which is space, which I know is something you've been very much focused on. Um, you know, here's... Uh, um, you know, an area in which our adversaries are working overtime to try to develop their capabilities, um, which can threaten American critical infrastructure and lots of other things that are important to us. It's also an area where there are really no international rules of the road right now, whether it's in terms of commerce or security or anything else. And so I think it's incumbent upon CIA to focus on issues like that, to be able to highlight the threat that's growing for American interests, and then to try to think creatively in support of policymakers about you know, how you anticipate those threats and begin today to plan um, for the best ways to deal with them. We look forward to working with you on all of that, I think. You know, I, I, as you write in your book, the, the, that period of time that Baker represents, you know, was a time when we were in the Cold War and we had an organizing principle of some kind, which didn't mean that we ma didn't make mistakes. We made mistakes all the time, but we had an organizing principle. And I think uh, we lost that at the end of the Cold War in some respects, that organizing principle, and then 9-11 happened and disoriented us. And I think really this moment is an opportunity to reinduce, reintroduce our values to the rest of the world uh, and do it, as you say, with a sense of optimism. You know, we should have a sense of optimism. A lot of countries that you've served in have had some version of January 6th happen to them. But what they don't have is what happened on January 20th here, which was the peaceful transfer of power. And I think that that should give us some confidence going forward. I hope it gives you confidence. I, I agree absolutely, Senator. I think we ought to approach However formidable the challenges are, we ought to approach them with a sense of confidence and optimism. That's what, in my long experience serving overseas for the United States government, whether people like our policies or hate them, what they expect from Americans is problem solving, a sense of possibility, a sense of optimism. 
That's what they admire most about our society when it's operating at its best. And that's what they hope to see from American leadership in the world. Just as you said, Senator, we don't always get it right. We don't have a monopoly on wisdom. But we ought not to underestimate that core strength that American society has and brings to the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Senator Sass. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ambassador, congratulations. Thanks, um, thank you for the time you spent with us in the run-up to this. And I'll just say, um, this committee, as is well known to the members and, and to you, um, is different than most committees on the Hill. And it's, I think, usually because we don't have cameras. Um, usually people don't have any incentive to make grandstanding speeches. And this, this committee works a lot better than most. Um, but I also just want to commend you on the substance of your opening statement. Uh, confirmation hearings are usually an exercise in defense where people don't want to say anything that could get them in trouble if they look likely to be confirmed. And you actually said a ton of substantive things. Um, I also think your answers uh, to Senator Rubio about CCP influence operations were meaty, so thank you for that. Um, so this is uh, uh, not a hostile question at all. It's uh, genuinely a sympathetic uh, question to your nomination. Uh, but you said in your opening statement that I think the biggest four priorities that you have uh, are China, tech, human capital, and I forget the term you used. I wrote Part down alliances. Partnerships, yes. Partner okay, personnel and, and partnerships. Um, I think that's exactly the right issue set for RIC. I think that's the, the right set, and I think it's the right order. Um, so. Uh, First of all, congratulations um, on having a, a substantive view of the important calling that you face. It is not bad that we've had to go through an evolution as a nation on our China policy, because everybody in a bipartisan way 20 years ago had a very different view about how things might work out with, with the Chinese uh, leadership, and obviously that hasn't happened. Could you walk us through a little bit of your evolution? Because you had different positions mm -hmm. in, say, 2013. I think I detect even an evolution from your Atlantic piece, which I read last July, June, mm -hmm. July, to your really meaty stuff today. So not a hostile question, but uh, walk us through your evolution in the last two or three years of how you sure. think about the CCP. Well, thanks, Senator, very much. Um, you know, I think the truth is that Xi Jinping's China, um, I, I mentioned the term wake-up call earlier in response to solar winds, but I think the evolution of Xi Jinping's China over the last six or seven years has been a very sharp wake-up call in a lot of ways, the kind of aggressive, undisguised ambition and assertiveness um, that, you know, I think has made very clear the nature of the adversary and rival that we face today. Um, and I think that's been true across partisan lines, not just in the Congress, but across our society. And, and the challenge, therefore, is how do you build a long-term, and I would emphasize the term long-term, because we have to buckle up for the long haul, I think, in competition with China. This is not like the competition with the Soviet Union and the Cold War, which was primarily in security and ideological terms. This is an adversary that is extraordinarily ambitious in technology and capable in economic terms as well. And so it's, it's buckling up for the long term and developing a very clear-eyed um, bipartisan strategy, which I think is entirely possible right now. My role, if I'm confirmed as director of CIA, will be to try to ensure it, not only that we approach this issue with urgency and with a very sharp focus, expand our capabilities you know, over the next couple of years, but then deliver the best possible intelligence about the nature of Chinese intentions and capabilities. That's the only way we'll be able to sustain that kind of long-term strategy. And then the only other thing I'd say, Senator, as we discussed before, a critical part of that is going to be working with allies and partners because that's where, you know, Xi Jinping's China and its wolf warrior diplomacy has actually created opportunities for us because it's helped open the eyes of lots of partners and allies, not just across Asia, but in other parts of the world, to the nature of that threat as well. And we need to try to take advantage of that, both in intelligence partnerships and then obviously, you know, more broadly in terms of diplomacy. Um, I, I want to transition a little bit to your bureaucratic challenges and trying to reorient the agency's budget and personnel to the challenges of today, not the challenges of the post-9-11 moment. If we had a lot more time, though, I would also want to drill down a little bit, and I may do that um, in private uh, in follow-up to this or in our classified time today. But a lot of us are very worried about um, Secretary Kerry's undefined role. Um, because Chairman Xi is going to lie about what they will do on climate. Like, that's not, that's not an open question. He's going to lie. And so it means if 
if we have all these real technological race challenges between the CCP and freedom-loving nations, the set of, you know, whatever the, the new NATO for the, the digital revolution is, the Trans-Pacific Partnership plus technology standards, whatever that thing is, um, if we take the pressure off in the alliance that we're going to build because there's some climate summit going to happen in 18 or 24 months where he's going to promise a bunch of pie in the sky, then everything we're saying ends up being a house of cards. So I'm, a lot of us are worried about the climate lies that are going to come from China as a way around this. But I would like to ask you, um, in the post-9-11 moment, it was right for us to be focused on the global CT threat and the spread of jihadism. That's not the biggest challenge we face right now, and yet most of our IC budget and personnel still has these lingering effects of 2002, 4, 6, 8, and 10. How are you going to make sure that the pivot toward the Pacific is really operative in budget and personnel decisions under your leadership? Well, thanks, Senator. I look forward to a longer conversation with you on both of those subjects. Briefly on climate, I just think it's important for the United States to view cooperation with China on climate issues. It's not a favor to the United States. It's in the self-interest of China to do that. So in other words, it's not something to be traded. It's in the self-interest of China as well to work on these issues. And it's important for us to be clear-eyed about that, as I'm sure the President and, and Secretary Kerry will be. Um, on, the, on the wider question that you raised, I don't have a neat formula to offer to you about the balance between what is a continuing threat posed by terrorist groups, even though we're almost 20 years after 9-11, and what are clearly huge emerging challenges, particularly China, but all the other ones that you mentioned. So it's, it's going to be critically important for the agency to adapt in terms of resources, in terms of focus, and everything else. I don't have a neat formula to offer to you today, but I look forward very much to working with you on that, because that adaptation um, inevitably is going to re re require prioritizing amongst resources and people. Thank you. I know the chairman's so going to take my mic, so I won't ask the question here, but I'll just flag that I'm going to follow up with you uh, as well about the historical advisory program. Mm -hmm. um, your memoir shows the importance of declassifying records. We need to protect sources and methods wherever we can. We, we must. It's essential. Um, but the inertia of motion should eventually be to declassification for public trust and for scholarly purposes. And I think right now the inertia inside most of our agencies is to assume if someone doesn't proactively declassify, it stays classified. Senator Casey. And I hope you'll return it to uh, – to your, to report Senator it. Cotton has been extraordinarily patient when we switch the order a little bit here today, so I want to make sure we uh, I don't try his patience any further. Senator Casey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, great to be with you. And uh, thank you. I come today to this hearing to thank you for, for to express gratitude for three reasons. Number one is for your exemplary public service, and I think that's an understatement. Number two, for your service, uh, the service of your family, starting with your your father and, and throughout uh, the time that your immediate family has served with you and provided their own measure of service. I'm especially grateful that your father has roots in Pennsylvania and, as I think you've told me before, specifically in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which yes, sir. Uh, provides a uh, special recognition for me. Uh, but most importantly, maybe for today, your recognition in your opening statement of the not only the service but the sacrifice of the men and women of the CIA. You talked about the, uh, those personal moments that you had uh, in front of that agency memorial wall and knowing some of those who had lost their lives. So I pre appreciate the fact that you recognize them. I wanted to ask two questions. One is country specific and one is uh, more broad about our national sec security threats. Uh, the staff drafted a very good question for a new member that I'll use. But on China, you said, and I'm quoting in your opening statement, outcompeting China is key to our national security. And I, I agree with that. Number two, when I consider the threats, the economic threats that China poses to a state like Pennsylvania, I've, I've often said that when China cheats, we lose jobs in Pennsylvania. So I guess j just in terms of the threats posed by China, I, I guess by way of kind of itemization or prioritization, how do you rank them, technology, economic, military? How would you assess the basic threats that China poses? Well, Senator Casey, it's good to see you again. I, I think as many of the members of this committee have argued eloquently in public, I think technology and competition and technology cuts right to the core 
of China's capacity to compete in military terms and economic terms as well. So if I had to underscore the, the core area that's going to matter most in terms of competition with an adversarial China, I think it, it cuts right to that issue of technology as we look out after, over the next decade or more. That's helpful. And uh, I wanted to speak more broadly now about national security threats. Um, Again, if you could just itemize, if, you, if, if that's uh, possible in a short answer, I know we don't have a lot of time, but the major national security threats that we face. And then in particular, and I think this is an important point that the staff made in the, the materials, how should the CIA be positioned to predict, provide a warning about, and to mitigate these threats? Well, Senator, I mean, one thing I've learned over the years is while it's very important to have priorities, and I think I would put at the top of the list, as I mentioned in my opening statement, the challenge posed by Xi Jinping's China, by an adversarial China, it's hard for me to see a more significant threat or challenge for the United States as far out as I can see into the 21st century than that one. It is the biggest geopolitical test that we face. Having said that, um, you know, in the same sentence, I would not want to give short shrift to a range of other challenges out there. As I mentioned, Putin's Russia continues to demonstrate that declining powers can be just as disruptive as rising ones and can make use of asymmetrical tools, especially cyber tools, to do that. So we can't afford to underestimate them. The you know nonproliferation challenges and the other challenges posed by Iranian behavior, for example, are, are hugely significant and ones that we can't afford to ignore across the board. Ballistic missile development, you know, as well as subversive and destabilizing actions in the Middle East and human rights abuses to its own people inside Iran as well. Um, and then, you, you know, as I said earlier, we have to look ahead as well to those emerging challenges, the, the problems without passports that we have to deal with that aren't confined to any one nation state, whether it's issues of global health insecurity, as, you know, the American people have, have faced um, in full measure over the course of the last year, whether it's the revolution in technology, whether it's, you know, other forms of, of instability um, or, or problems they're going to create challenges for the United States down the road. So, um, you know, if I, if, if I had to put one set of challenges at the top of the list, it would certainly be China, as I mentioned before. Um, but we just don't have the luxury of neglecting any of those other challenges as well. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. We look forward to supporting your confirmation. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator. Mr. Senator Cotton. Mr. Burns. Uh, nice. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Time today. Congratulations on your nomination. Um, I want to. Sorry. Could, is there any way we can figure out what's going on with the mics? I don't know. It's. Testing. Testing. Thank you, Senator Cotton. I'm sure you'll be restarting my five-minute clock now. You had to wait. You've been very patient. I appreciate that. Restart the clock. So, uh, Mr. Burns, I want to start by adding my voice to uh, Senator Warner and Senator Collins' concerns about the microwave attacks uh, at our embassies around the country. I won't belabor that. I'll just say that I share that, and I appreciate your commitment to getting to the bottom of it and taking care of anyone uh, who has been injured in it. Uh, more, Thank broad you. more broadly, as we discussed in the phone last week, uh, I've taken an interest over the years in the health of our special activity center inside the CIA, um, specifically, the, or I should say, the metaphorical health in terms of the numbers of paramilitary officers available um, and the workload we're asking them to bear, but also the literal health uh, because many of them do suffer the same kind of wounds that our service members face. And I just want to uh, speak today publicly about what we discussed on the phone. You do commit to ensuring that these officers and their families have the very best medical care and support available. Absolutely, sir. I, I've seen firsthand the sacrifices that they've made, the courage they've demonstrated, especially over the last 20 years, and so I'm absolutely committed to that. And that includes continu continuing the work that uh, Director Haspel and her leadership has already started uh, yes, sir. to ensure that these officers have care that is equal to, if not better than, what we already provide our service members and veterans. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I want to touch briefly on another point that we discussed. You're probably aware that I briefly held uh, Director Haynes' nomination to be Director of National Intelligence um, after a, an answer to one of her questions had implied that she might 
reconsider some actions taken on long concluded accountability review boards related to long closed terrorist detention programs. Um, I, I'm troubled by some media reports I've seen that suggest a senior CIA officer who was detailed to the DNI has recently had his portfolio reduced because uh, of his involvement in that program. Uh, I would just like to get your commitment that if confirmed, you'll abide by the determination of the Obama administration not to resurrect any efforts to prosecute or take administration administrative action against or prejudice in any way in any future promotion or selection panels for any CIA officer involved with those programs that were conducted under DOJ guidance and presidential direction? Yes, Senator. As I mentioned earlier, um, you have my commitment not to take actions um, against or prejudice the careers of officers who may have worked on those programs in the past when they were operating under Department of Justice guidelines and at the direction of the president. Yes, sir. Thank you. We also talked in our phone call about the importance of everything the CIA does, but the centrality of the collection of foreign intelligence. And to put it in military terms, that collection is the main effort at the CIA. Um, yes, sir. And that, that means primarily the department or the director of operations, but also other elements of the agency in science and technology and the uh, new digital directorate. Um, you agree that collection of foreign intelligence is the main effort at the Central it, Intelligence Agency? It, it's the core of CIA's mission. Analysis, you know, in other words, what you do with that collection to put it in a form that's going to be most useful to policymakers is obviously critical as well. But at the core of what the CIA does is that foreign collection and particularly human intelligence. And that's because the collection of foreign intelligence, put in layman's terms, stealing foreign secrets, is what allows those analysts to have an even richer analysis than what they would have if they were only using publicly available sources, the way, say, an academic or a think tank scholar might. That, that's correct. And, and it does involve, as you said, stealing secrets and doing it in a way that's superior to what our rivals and adversaries try to do. Thank you. We also talked about covert action. Um, I shared my views that too often uh, administrations in the past of both parties have viewed covert action not as a supplement to policy, but as a substitute for policy. Would you agree with that assessment? Yeah, and I think it's one of the big dangers. I mean, I haven't had a chance to be briefed in detail on, on existing covert action programs, and it's something I'd look forward to talking about in, in closed sessions in the future. But your point about connecting covert action programs at the direction of the president to coherent policy is absolutely crucial. It cannot be a substitute for uh, sound policy choices. Um. It is, though, however, in many cases, a sound supplement to a broader foreign policy and that we should not have a reluctance to use it where it is have... have yes, sir. As, as, one tool, as one tool in a coherent strategy and policy, I absolutely agree with you. When you were out of government, you said, quote, it is simply impractical to think that the United States will provide sanction, significant sanctions relief without assurances that Iran will immediately begin negotiations on a follow-on agreement that at least extends the timelines of the deal and addresses issues of verification and intercontinental ballistic missiles. I agree. If confirmed, Mr. Burns, will you provide that same realistic assessment to the administration, even if it contradicts the administration's preferred policy approach to negotiations? Yes, sir. Um, Senator, on, on Iran, as well as on the whole range of other issues, it'll be my obligation, if confirmed, to deliver those intelligence assessments in a straightforward and unvarnished way. Thank you, Mr. Burns. I look forward to talking about some of these other matters in, uh, later this afternoon. At the Thank you, sir. Meeting. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Um, we now have Senator Gillibrand on WebEx. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Over the last year alone, according to public reports, Russia attempted to influence the 2020 election and stoke discord in our country, attempted to assassinate a prominent anti-corruption activist using nerve agent, and perpetrated the SolarWinds hack, one of the largest cyber intrusions ever that breached sensitive U.S. government systems. Obviously, you've served as ambassador to Moscow, you speak Russian. Where do you think we should start with the Kremlin? And if you are confirmed, what would be your approach to this profound challenge? Well, Senator, it's, it's nice to see you, and I enjoyed our, our conversation earlier this week. Um, yeah, certainly, I think it's a huge mistake, as I said earlier, not to underestimate um, the challenge and the threat that Vladimir Putin's Russia can pose to the United States. Um, 
my, my own view in the past, both serving as a policymaker and then as a private citizen, has been there's no substitute for firmness and consistency um, in dealing with Putin's Russia and working as closely as we can with allies and partners who share those same concerns. I know the Biden administration is um, soon to produce uh, a, a, an assessment of all of those issues that you just mentioned, from solar winds to the poisoning and then the cruel absurdity, as the chairman has put it publicly, of sentencing Alexei Navalny to years in a penal colony for failing to check in with his parole officer when the reason he failed to check in is that he was in a coma having, uh, after an attempted assassination attempt, clearly sponsored by the Kremlin, to poison him to death. So there's a whole range of issues on which I know this assessment will not only provide the best uh, intelligence that we're capable of on exactly what happened in those instances, but also a sense of the consequences for them as well. And so if I'm confirmed, I look forward very much uh, to participating in that effort and in what flows from it in the future. So the short answer, Senator, is I think there's no substitute for firmness and consistency and being clear-eyed, because the reality is that I think in terms of American policy of U.S.-Russian relations, as long as Vladimir Putin is the leader of Russia, we're going to be operating within a pretty narrow band of possibilities, from the very sharply competitive to the very nastily adversarial. Yes, I, I think we also will have a similar challenge with regard to China. Um, and obviously, there's a great deal of strategic competition with China right now. Um, but we also want to have some kind of engagement strategy. Can you expand upon your views on what you would like to uh, do to approach China? Well, I think, again, you know, if I'm confirmed as the director of CIA, my role won't be as a policymaker anymore. But I think the the core of sound policy choices is the best intelligence we can provide about the intentions and capabilities of Xi Jinping's China. Um, and that's something that we need to develop ourselves. We need to work closely with allies and partners who share many of those same concerns. So as I said earlier, Senator, I think it's absolutely important to be quite clear-eyed about the long-term nature of that challenge from you know, an adversarial China under Xi Jinping's leadership and to help policymakers think through the various ways in which those threats can emerge, to look carefully at vulnerabilities, whether it's in supply chains or in other areas, and to always be mindful of the value for the United States of working closely with allies and partners in developing that intelligence, but also in, in developing and executing smart policy. And your third large challenge, at least for the nation and President Biden, is Iran. And I know you were instrumental in the negotiations under the Obama administration. What do you think uh, the approach will be with regard to Iran? Well, I've always thought that the key to dealing with the variety of threats that are posed by Iran today um, is a comprehensive strategy of which preventing Iran from developing a nuclear weapon is only one part. It has to be a strategy that pushes back against threatening Iranian actions, whether it's in developing ballistic missiles, in destabilizing its region, or subverting other governments, or human rights abuses against its own people. And so I think in, in all those areas, we have to be mindful of the fact that even if Iran returns to full compliance with the Comprehensive Nuclear Agreement, and the United States does as well, as President Biden said he's prepared to do, that then needs to be a platform, Secretary Blinken has emphasized this, a platform for building longer and stronger nuclear constraints and also for dealing with those, those other areas of uh, threatening Iranian actions that I mentioned before. I know that's easier said than done, but that needs to be the clear strategy, it seems to me. And my role, if I'm confirmed, will be to help provide the best possible intelligence as policymakers pursue that strategy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Gillibrand. And Senator Rubio, any other? Okay. Well, Ambassador Burns, you, you got through the first first hurdle, 15 out of 16, and if Senator Rich joins us, we'll get first crack in the closed session. Um, we will, uh, uh, the hearing will go into recess, and we will reconvene at 1 o'clock, and very much appreciate your testimony. And Thank you. Again, to echo Senator Wyden's comments, rarely does a nominee come before this committee with this much uh, positive approval, although 
rarely does a nominee also bring Jim Baker and Leon Panetta as their introducers. So we'll look forward to seeing you at 1 o'clock. Thanks. Committee stands in recess.